psychologists and uh, a lot of different varieties. And the guest today has got some very interesting things to talk about in terms of uh, the workforce, um, employers, employees, and how things uh, go on behind the scenes in American manufacturing or what's left of it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you, Shepard November. Shepard, how are you today? Uh, better than I deserve, sir. <laughs> what do you, you deserve? You deserve less? Come on. What does that mean? Well, it's it's an old Dave Ramsey line, but oh, okay. I've taken it. Better than I deserve. I've done well from in spite of myself. Fair enough. All right. You've got a bunch of books out, and I want to focus on the, the one that's of, of most interest to our readers or viewers today. So yeah. before we get to that, I want to hear a little about your story. Give me a background on who you are and how you came to write these books. Well, I came up as a welfare kid in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and from the age of three, I could identify every car just by its body style before yeah. I could even read. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with a love of cars, a love of vehicles. I didn't care what they were. I built model cars as a kid, yeah. and that was my future vocation. I wanted to be an auto mechanic and or work in the vehicle industry, yep. and that's what I always wanted to do. And just mm -hmm. to jump ahead a little bit. You know, little boys love fire trucks. <laughs> I grew up and I got to play with them. I got yeah. to put them together. Mm -hmm. So that's basically where I am right now. You still playing with fire trucks or what? What do you mean? No, I'm retired now. <laughs> okay. Well, due to several injuries. Now uh -huh. I'm an airport transportation driver. But I yeah. still do my own work on automobiles just as a hobby. Nice. I just got to putting a fuel pump in my 2000 uh, Chevrolet S10. There you go. You know, uh, people today don't know how to fix things. It's, it shocks me what gets discarded and thrown away versus repaired. You know, it's crazy. You should see how it was on the assembly lines, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Let's hear about that. I want to hold up your book for a second. I want to see this book. It's called All in a Day's Work. Look at that. Okay. Uh, it, All in a Day's Work. I love of the American work ethic. I love double entendres, all days, D-A-Z-E. -E. So are, are workers in a days here or what? What's going on? Yes. Well, <laughs> let me give you let me give you the shortest story out of the book. Sure, please I do. I was installing windshields in fire trucks. Now, you've seen how enormous those windshields are. Oh, yeah. Okay? Now, I was given the proper procedures to install them, and we had a lot of problems with these windshields failing, with the trucks failing the water test. Uh -huh. they, they'd leak. Or worse yet, they'd leak when they got out into service. So... I was watching a guy putting a windshield in while I was installing one, and I said, you know, we've had a lot of problems with these things leaking. Mm -hmm. He says, yes, yeah, so? I said, okay, what if it fails a water test? He says, well, someone will go fix it. I said, okay, what if that someone is me? He, what do you <laughs> care? You get paid by the hour. I said, yeah. now, wait a minute. What if it, what if it fails? The, what if it uh, starts leaking after the truck's been put in service? And he says, well, you know, someone from warranty will fix it. I said, you know, for, for God's sakes, this truck may have to save your life one day. He leans over, looks at where the truck is going, and says, I ain't ever going to Cincinnati. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And that's what I've seen. Wow. Uh, when I worked as an auto mechanic at an import car dealership, one of my jobs was installing air conditioners. Uh -huh. The other mechanics could do them in two hours. It took me three. The job paid five hours. Okay. Uh, they were telling me that, well, they were telling, I, I was saying I was uh, dragging down the shop time. Okay. Well, yeah. they were, they told me to refine my technique. I should leave parts off, leave out bolts, short, <laughs> I am not making this up, shortcut procedures. There's a part called a receiver dryer that mm -hmm. bolts to the radiator support of the vehicle. Okay. You have to take the whole grill off to install this thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a bracket that holds it in place. They just said, leave it off. So I pointed to one. I said, you mean this one here? It said, is that where that goes? I ain't never put one in. I said, but guys, if you don't put that bracket in there, the aluminum tube will vibrate, and eventually it'll crack, and the yeah. Freon will escape. Right. They said, oh, don't worry about that. By the time that happens, it'll be out of warranty. We'll get paid to fix it. Lovely. I swear to you, this really happened, and I write about that's uh, that's in book one. Okay. That story. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of... Uh no, you know, big lack of accountability. Obviously, I, I can I can hear yes. that coming down the road here. Um, what can we do about it, man? That's you know, I well, get right the solution mode if you don't mind. First off, at the fire truck factory, whenever I would try to point out a problem, and I try to point out what was messed up without pointing out who messed up. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the Japanese way of doing things. Uh -huh. And they would tell me the, the slogan at the factory was "Be a problem solver, not a finger pointer," right. or it's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Yeah. I said, fine. Can we take this opportunity to solve this problem? 
And they ended up telling me, well, just fix it. I said, okay, I'll fix it, but how do we prevent this in the future? Yeah. Well, that's not your concern. Well, now, wait a minute. You've already paid him to do it once. Now you're paying me to do it again. I don't have a business degree, and even I know that's affecting profits. Yep. And, the, and management. Management would say to me, what do you care? You get paid by the hour. Management would I say that. I actually got angry with a coworker, and I was really lacing it into him something fierce. Yeah. I was called into the office. And my plant manager said that very thing to me. What do you care? You get paid by the hour. And I said to my plant manager, look, I'm a stockholder in this company. Mm -hmm. I need this company to do well. Yeah. My retirement is tied to how well this company does. I don't want to be one of those little old men who only has a can of tuna fish per day and, ha and prays my Social Security check isn't late. Yeah. He leaned forward, jabbed a jabbed a finger in my direction and said, your little investment in this company doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Wow. And so they, you, you've worked in more than one place here, right, Shepard? I mean, you've, yes, I worked. I uh, was a mechanic at several dealerships, right. primarily import dealerships. Okay. I worked as a designer and builder of luxury conversion vans, and I also built fire trucks. Okay. So is this, this problem, is it, uh, where does it come from and where, how – widespread is it i think a lot of people have this a lot of american workers have this immature party attitude mm -hmm. i mean what do you think what do you what would you think was the moment you clock in you're clocking in and the moment one of your co-workers clocks in he's saying come on quitting time oh boy and i'm like dude you just clocked in and mm -hmm. I can tell you that even on the assembly lines, when they should be focused on the job they're doing, for Monday and Tuesday, they talk about what they did last weekend. For Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they're talking about what they're going to do this weekend. Mm -hmm. And cross-training, forget it. Okay, yeah. I wanted to learn every job on that assembly mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. With luxury conversion vans, I could build one basically by myself if I had to. Nice. Except for paint, which we sent it out. We sent them out for paint. Yeah. Okay. But whenever I would tell people, look, you need to cross train, they'd say, no, I hired in to put in seats. I hired in to put on sirens. Right. I hired in to put in floors. I hired in to put in windshields. Yeah. Okay, but you still want your raises. Oh, yeah, I want my raises. Well, why don't you show them that you're worth more money and they'll give you raises? No, let them give me the raise first and then I'll do the job. No, no, no. It doesn't so work that way. There's there's no quality assurance incentives for any uh, any of, the, of these workers at all. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about you know what people uh, you know management may or may not be interested in this, but I mean certainly you said the stockholders would be. I mean, is there no way yeah. to do that? Well, let me put it this way. I asked one of my crew leaders. I said, look. Why is it you will not address these quality issues? Mm -hmm. You come to me to fix this problem or someone like me. There are plenty of good workers. Right. You know, but you know what they say about a few bad apples. Right. You know, right. they spoil right. the whole bunch. And <clears throat> I would say, why do you keep coming to me or somebody like me to fix this problem? When, why can't you go and why don't you discipline the people that are doing this? Right. And his answer to me was, it's easier to have you fix it than to fight them in court. Because the court, they, their lawyer, they can go to legal aid and get a lawyer for nothing. We have to pay for right. ours. So even if we win, we lose. Okay. The comp, the lawyer will portray them as the overworked, underpaid, exploited worker, and they will portray us as the big, evil, mean corporation. Is that a? Uh, you said it comes from management. Is that a fear of, of union stuff, or what's the? Uh, we had a union drive. We have we had six union drives at the factory, uh -huh. of which I survived all six of them. What do you mean survive? Uh, what does that mean, survive? It means that I never got cut. Okay. I mean, well, when I – excuse me. I meant to say layoffs. I'm sorry. That's fine. That's fine. But in five out of six union drives, I opposed the union, mm -hmm. okay? In one union drive, because of that episode where I was told my investment in the company didn't amount to a hill of beans yeah. – I signed a union card. So people say, well, you're anti-union. No, I'm not. If I'm being treated well, I'm not going to join a union. But, right. But I remember for, for that incident when I got mad at an employee that a, got a co-worker for not doing their job, mm -hmm. they said – my plant manager said to me, well, we're going to send you for anger management. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not necessary. I managed to get uh, angry. That's fine. Thank you. I'm really good at it. Huh? I'm really well, good at it. That's really fun. good at it. And, uh, and let me share something else with you. Uh, 
I, uh, I, when they sent me to the counselor, you're gonna, you might, I, I don't know where you are politically, but when they sent me to the counselor, yeah. the counselor said, this was in the 90s, mind you, but it applies mm -hmm. today. He said, Shep, don't take it personally. With what's going on in the, in the news nowadays, they just want to make sure you don't come back with an Uzi or an AK-47 and blow everyone away. I said, oh, please. There's no chance of that happening. All my weapons are American. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. Yeah. That's right. That's what I want to mean about gun control is having good aim, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, I didn't want to get political, but yeah, I had at, to put that nah, in there. we have no rules in the show. It's all good. But I, I, I can honestly tell you that one of the companies I work for, and I'm not going to say which one because I want people to read the book series. It's a uh, four-book series. Uh -huh. All the books look the same except for the number in the upper corner where, it, where they're numbered, it. books one through four. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. But I come to find out that one of the companies I work for was actually meant to lose money. Oh. And I found this out totally by accident. Uh -huh. And it was like, now I know why they've been making all these bonehead decisions. Wow. Okay, but we had this one guy who I, I worked the second job as a, as a security guard, mm -hmm. as an armed guard at a hotel, mm -hmm. and one of my coworkers was arrested for drug dealing and drug use. Lovely. And I said, "Well, I guess we won't be seeing him again." So a, a few <laughs> months later, he's back. I said, well, what's he doing back here? Well, he's back on a work release program. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. And I said, "No, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, you." I thought we were rid of him, and now I have to put up with him. And they said, well, it looks good for us if we if we take him back. So let me get this yeah. straight. It looks good for us if we hire dopers, but it doesn't look, but it look, but it looks bad for us if we don't, right? Uh -huh. And I said, look, I got news for you. I know all about his arrest, trial, and conviction. Well, that wasn't exactly true, but I made it sound good. Uh -huh. They said, how do you know about that? I said, well, I'm a security guard at the hotel. OK, mm -hmm. the, the, the local police officers here think of me as one of their own, uh -huh. which they did. Uh -huh. <laughs> so crazy. I used to and I and they told me they said, well, don't worry. You know, he's drug tested once a month. I said, really? Is that why a cup of pee is going for one hundred dollars on the street? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, how do you know that? I said, eh, you oh, know. Google that. There's, there's you got like fake prosthetics and tubes, the whole thing. I've seen those are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, there. I've known of. I've known of people. Never known yeah. people. Right. Known people who were offered money for, yeah. for a clean cup of urine. Yeah. 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 That's, so that's honestly the speaking, the, re the reason I wrote this book series mm -hmm. is our president says he's going to bring jobs back to the United States. Uh -huh. Okay, neat trick, Trump Dini. Let's see you do it. <laughs> My thing is, who are we going to get to fill these jobs? I work with people, I kid you not, who could not read on a high school level. I had to read the work orders to them. Yeah. They did not know. They could not read a simple tape measure. They did not know the difference between three-eighths and three-quarters. And they're getting 35 40 bucks an hour too or what? I mean what's the uh, – We were at 15 bucks an hour. Bucks. This is okay. Florida. All right. But you got to understand here in north central Florida – the cost of living was a lot lower. Yeah, I was thinking UAW rates. I know we're, we're a lot bigger, so okay, yeah. Right. Let me give yeah. you an example. When I bought my house, my first house in 1987, mm -hmm. 80, yeah. yes, the house was $45,000. A yeah. comparable house at the time in New York or L.A. would have been like 180, 190. Got it, right. Okay. And we have no state income tax in the state of Florida and like, like that. that. So – even though uh, – how do you get by on 15 bucks an hour? Well, the cost of living is a lot lower here. Got it. Got it. Okay. So it, so it all balances out. All right. But <clears throat> I, but I would tell people – I I mean pe people would actually ask me, well, three-eighths is bigger than three-quarters, right? Oh how do you figure that? Well, eight's more than four, right? <laughs> no. I am not making this up. I know. I know. I mean when I went to school, you know, I, we had shop class and uh, I had uh, architecture class, all these things. How to, how did you know – basic skill stuff now they don't have any of that anymore no and, the, and I, I did a habitat for humanity thing it was pretty funny i was years ago and i took uh, about 40 uh, high school yeah junior high school kids to to basically put a roof on this person's home and 40 kids right and not a single one could mm -hmm. swing a hammer they right did, they didn't know how and they're, right. going, they're going like this i'm like no you go like this i mean basic stuff is just crazy how a simple thing was, you know, so well, out of touch, you know. 
Weird. Got a little side note here. I'm an avid reader. I've read over 200 novels and fact-based books. Yeah. And I used to read on my lunch breaks. Uh -huh. I kid you not. I had coworkers. If I was reading a book like The Hunt for Red October, yeah. Jurassic Park, something that had been made into a motion picture, mm -hmm. they would say, "Uh, dude, why don't you just watch the movie? It'll only take two hours." <laughs> Because Hunter Red October, I learned a lot about uh, naval warfare and systems yeah. and arc and uh, yeah, pressures. I mean, yeah, so much detail he puts in the book, right? Yeah. Yeah, don't get me wrong. The movie yeah. was great, yeah, it was, but both the good, book yeah. goes into so much detail. Right, right, right. And right. I would read history. You you know, you look at uh, these, you remember Jay Leno's jaywalking program? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Remember. Yeah. And he would go on the street and ask people simple history, government, oh, or. So sad, or yeah. And they had no freaking clue. And I watched it with a mom, and she thought it was made up. I'm like, no, mom, there are people who are really dumb. <laughs> it's just the way yeah. it is. And, hey, let and, and when I would tell people, I'd say, look, I'm not uh, at the factories. I would say, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Uh -huh. Come on. If I can figure this out, anyone can figure right, it out. Right. And they'd say to me, well, not everyone is as stooped as you are, Shep. And I'd play stupid. I'd say, uh, astute, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means you're very smart. It means you're smarter than most people here. Right, right. Really. Okay. And like so, my work. What? Yes, and I, okay, so if you like my work, why are you not listening to me? <laughs> Let, let's, get, let's get to how we can help people out here because one of the things you mentioned to me before a call today was that um, there are certain days not uh, not to buy a car when it comes off the line on a certain day or something. Yes. Is there anything consumers can do to at least – play the system a little bit to their advantage in terms of buying a vehicle. Uh, it's often been said, never buy a car that was made on a Friday or a Monday. Right, but how do you know that? Friday, huh? How would you know that? Well, you can check the production date of the vehicle. Most oh. vehicles have a production date. If you look on the production placard that's okay. in the inside door, they usually tell you when it was made. For example, my little 99 Hyundai Accent, February 9th, 1999. Got it. Okay. My, but let, yeah. me, let me ask you a question, though. Okay, so February 9th, how long from start to finish is that car on the line? Well, you generally want to get one built in the middle of the week. No, no. How long does it take to build a car? Is it a day, a week? How long does oh, it take to – no. Those, oh, my goodness. Those cars uh, – I, well, I didn't work the automotive lines. I worked truck lines. But I can tell you that car is built in a matter, in a matter of hours. Oh, wow. I didn't know yeah, that. Okay. Yeah, built in a matter of hours, start to finish, assuming they have all the parts on hand. Okay. All right. So avoid Mondays and Fridays because people either like – Hung over yeah. or not paying they attention. You could get out on Friday to go party at the bars and pubs, and on Monday they're too hung over to do a good and they're too hung over to do a good job. Right. Have you um? Do you have you on your uh, on your travels and research? Did you have any like I don't know any measurements on this like percent of quality or anything on the the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday models? Let me put it this way. I can tell you that when I was at the fire truck factory, yeah. we had 150, 200 item defect lists on the fire trucks that had to be cured. Yeah. And that was average. Okay. That yeah. was before they left the factory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I can honestly tell you, let me give you a quick little story here. Back in 1982, we got a first, I don't want to name the manufacturer, but we got in the very first, actually it was 81. Uh, we got in the first cars that were supposed to meant to beat the Japanese at their own game. Yep. This was yeah. – okay, and I'm not going to name the car. That's all right. So we got it in, in July of 1981. We weren't allowed to sell it. We could only de – we could only demonstrate it. Uh -huh. Okay? So here comes the transport. We're all, ooh, ah, yeah. We couldn't get it started to get it off the transport. <laughs> That's hilarious. We, they pushed it off, and we put our top mechanic to work on it. He'd never worked on a car like this before. No one had. Yeah. So after a few hours of tearing his hair out, he says, well, near as I can tell, uh, the, we need a new computer. So the, comp oh, the, the manufacturer air freighted us a new computer overnight. They plugged it oh. in, still wouldn't start. Hmm. And they're breathing down his neck, get it working. we got to take it to an auto show. Come on, get it working. He's going through every connection with a magnifying glass. And I'm shadowing him. I want to learn. Yeah. And he looks, he goes, I'll be darned. I go, what? He says, look. And I'm going, what am I looking for? He says, look. And I'm looking close. There was a tiny metal tab that was bent, not making contact, that would not enable the computer to enable the ignition system of the car. Okay. okay? Now, now that tells me it didn't even start at the factory. They just pushed it on the transport to get it out. 
Let the dealer worry about yeah, it. Yeah, they didn't even they, test it. They didn't turn it on after, they after the line. They didn't test it. Yeah. Let me, there, if you've ever seen let me get, make a couple of recommendations here. The Ron yeah. Howard movie, Gung Ho. Uh-huh, yeah, I remember that one, sure. Okay, there yeah. was more true in that movie than not true. Mm. There's another one you might want to see. It was a book by Colonel James Burton, U.S. Air Force, retired, mm -hmm. called The Pentagon Wars. Uh -huh. It was about the debacle of the Bradley fighting vehicle. Oh, yes, I remember that one, yeah. Okay, they made it into a movie. Yeah, which did they? Oh, God. It shows you the decline and fall of the American work ethic is even in the U.S. military. My point is, if we are going to compete on a world stage, yeah. okay, we have to be better. We have to be what we used to be. Mm -hmm. We didn't, During World War II, we didn't beat Japan and Germany. We outproduced them. Correct, right. Yeah. You see, because my father was a World War II veteran. Yeah. He said German military equipment was far superior. Oh, to sure. Certainly. Yeah. OK. Yeah, very precise. Our advantage was we had so much more of it. Yeah. Volume. Right, right. And right. the point I'm making here is people need cars that accumulate more miles horizontally than vertically. Right. This is why we see all these Asian cars on the road. Mm hmm. And and I, and I remember when I would get pe people would tell me, you know, why do you if you're so concerned about American workers, why do you buy all those foreign cars? I said, why don't you answer your own question? OK, why do you think I did that? I'm an airport driver. I need a car that will not lie down on me. OK, yep. I cannot afford to have my car at the dealership. Right. Well, just give you a loaner car. I don't have the time it's, for that. That's not the point. Yeah. Do it right. Do it right the first time. Uh, right. what's, what's, the, what's the biggest benefit or takeaway someone can, can get from reading your book? Well, if you're a worker, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, first off, find what you love to do. Get paid for it. You'll never have to work a day in your life. Yeah. Okay? If you are working a menial job, and mm -hmm. I worked a bunch of them to put myself through trade school. Right. Okay? Just keep in mind, it's not forever uh -huh. now if you keep up this attitude that what that was what i saw in the bronx i'll never get out of here yeah. man's trying to keep me down uh -huh. my own father told me that i would never be anything more than what i am the oh. people in my neighborhood told me i'd never be anything more than what i am stop thinking that way mm -hmm. and i'm gonna say right here stop asking for 15 dollars an hour to scrub toilets and flip hamburgers yeah okay? That job is not worth it. Let me give you an example. When I was working at the fire truck factory uh -huh. and I was getting my good wages there, right. I was working a second job to put my son through college. Uh -huh. yeah. I was I worked for a car rental agency. I won't name them, but I worked for a car rental agency. I was washing and cleaning cars, getting barely over minimum wage. Okay. Now it's not that the Okay, I'm worth a lot of money at the fire truck factory, but washing and cleaning cars and driving people around, that isn't worth much. No. But I did it because I was paying my son's rent at his dorm so right. he could concentrate on his studies. Yeah, you make a sacrifice for your kids. So the big so, so if you're if you're uh, an American worker, take some responsibility for what you yes. produce, right? That's the biggest right. lesson we can take. If you're yes. an, if you're an employer, Especially these big ones, I guess that's that's a different challenge because you really got to focus yeah. on quality and not just the hour, right? right. You know, that's some more QA right. stuff. And the other thing is, I'm asking government knock it off with these ridiculous work rules. Knock it <laughs> off with the political correctness. Good okay? luck. Okay. Yeah. If somebody says something that offends you, get over it. Okay. <laughs> Many times they didn't mean it. Okay. Yeah. Another thing is, simply put. You know, I was told, well, we have to be diverse. Yeah. What do you mean by yeah. diverse? And you know what diversity is in the workplace. I said, no, 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 that's not diversity. In a fire truck factory, we need engineers to design it. We need fabricators to fabricate the parts, welders to weld them together, sanders yeah. and shapers, painters. We need mechanics to install the drivetrain, electricians to snake the cable, plumbers to put the piping in, assemblers to do the general assembly work. Now, when I'm working with someone, I don't care – Right. What ethnicity they are. I don't care what religion they practice. I don't care who they sleep with. I don't care. We have a job to do. And when someone tells me they don't pay me enough to care, there's the door. 
All right, Shepard Amendment for president, folks. Mark it down. There we go. Or at least governor or safe. Hold up your book, book again, Shepard. Let's take a look at the book before we sign off here. All in a Day's Work by Shepard November. There's a series of books there. Um, if book you're one through four. Yeah, that's right. If you're a, uh, a worker, employer, or just want to find out how to get your kid through trade school and be proud of his work, this is the book series for you. Shepard November, available on Amazon.com, I believe. So yes. go get your one, books there. And one last thing. This yes. is the first book series of its kind written as seen through the eyes of a blue-collar worker. Outstanding. Thank you so much for your time today, Shepard. I appreciate you. This is Thank Doug, you. Doug Crow with uh, Conversations and Cocktails. Enjoy. We'll see you next week.